Hey guys, and welcome back to Utility Sports. If you do enjoy NFL mock drafts, here is the place to subscribe. We are constantly pushing out NFL mocks as the offseason progresses and all the way up and through the NFL draft, we are going to be talking all things draft related. So now looking at this mock draft, we are going to be doing NFL mock draft with trade. So we are going to have some trades in this. Really excited to go ahead and proceed with this. Uh, at the number one pick, I don't think there's any movement. For me personally, Trevor Lawrence is the pick. Yeah, definitely. Trevor Lawrence is going to be a Jacksonville Jaguar at the end of the day. I really don't see a pathway that he isn't. Obviously, the rumors about Ryan Day, Urban Meyer might get some Jaguars fans a little nervous if they want Trevor Lawrence to be their guy. However, I just think his track record, his success at Clemson that he's found, I, I just feel like his uh, longevity uh, at that quarterback position for Clemson is going to secure him the number one overall selection in this year's draft. Tank for Trevor is very real, and the Jaguars are the ones walking away with him. So Trevor Lawrence goes number one to Jacksonville. Now kind of looking at the New York Jets, there's a lot of speculation on where they're going to go with their selection. We do have a potential trade here that we would like to take a look at. I am going to go ahead and move this Jets selection to an NFC team, which is actually not far behind them in this draft process. That is the Atlanta Falcons. So what would be out the door? So we would have two going from the Jets to the Falcons. Obviously, the Falcons would send back four. They would also send back a 2022 second. They would also send in pick 68 that they own. And this would be the deal. What does this have significance for in this trade, Sheldon? What do you kind of see with this deal? Well, right. Looking at this, there's an obvious pathway that Atlanta wants to go uh, doing this deal. Um, here, the... <laughs> so we're going to go ahead and keep proceeding with this. Yeah. Obviously, that for some reason got declined. I don't know why, because we are using all of the, the teams so far. But just under this assumption, take a look at it. The Atlanta Falcons are picking two in this. Yep, definitely. The Atlanta Falcons would be going to grab Justin Fields' quarterback long-term option. Obviously, there's a head coach of a you can see there after uh, Quinn got fired this year. Obviously, they moved on from their GM, Thomas Dimitrov. And it could be uh, the long-term turnaround from Matt Ryan. You bring in a guy like Justin Fields, let him sit for a year, let him learn the system with whoever the new head coach is. Could be Eric Bieniemy, And at that point, you're building long-term with Justin Fields at the quarterback position. He is going to be the selection there for the Atlanta Falcons, assuming they make a move with the New York Jets. Obviously, don't give up a ton of capital either. Only a second rounder next year and a third rounder this year is pretty cheap to move up and get your guy at that QB position. Yep, so once again, under that assumption, that is Atlanta at two. We made that selection. Now here's another trade that we do have coming. So looking at this trade as a whole, we have the, Mal the Dolphins moving back with Cincinnati. Cincinnati is coming up to go, go ahead and select Panay Sewell. Let's go take a look and see what that would potentially look like. All trades were done using the NFL draft pick chart that a lot of executives use in order to value draft picks. So that is why, you know, we did what we did with the prior one. It would have worked out in real life. Not sure why the simulation showed it, showed it a different way, but here we go with these two teams. Obviously Cincinnati is giving up three or excuse me, Dolphins are giving up three. Cincinnati is giving up five but they would also be giving up pick 69 and a 2022 second round or excuse me, third round pick in this deal. We'll go ahead and see what they have to say. They say it's declined. Once again, they do not clearly have the draft pick chart, um, the numbers installed into it. So going off of that, we still have this deal being made at pick three. We have Cincinnati's taking Panay Sewell. So remember Dolphins move back to five. Cincinnati moves up to three. Panay Sewell's the pick. Yeah, Sewell going here to uh, Cincinnati makes a lot of sense. Now, they are giving up quite a bit to move up to grab a tackle, but ultimately that tackle not only is going to be a long-term starter, a long-term long you know, franchise cornerstone for them, but he's also protecting the guy they took first overall last year, Joe Burrow. That's why they have to be willing to mortgage a little bit of those future assets to make sure they go get a guy that's going to keep their number one pick on the field. Joe Burrow with uh, Sewell there is a no-brainer. Now we're sitting here at pick four. We have the New York Jets selecting at that Atlanta Falcons spot. So kind of looking at what, what's on the board, potentially they could look at the quarterback position. Ultimately, we're not sure exactly if that's where they would be looking at this point. We think they might be trying to build around Sam Darnold at this point under the assumption they do trade down. So taking a look at what is on the board, Jamar Chase is a big time player coming out of the SEC. 
we actually have the Jets selecting him here at pick four. Yeah, Jamar Chase going to the New York Jets. Uh, that's kind of a, a thing that the New York Jets should be looking at here. From the sound of it, Joe Douglas doesn't really know what he's going to do with Sam Darnold yet. It sounds like they're going to have some discussions on whether or not they should trade him, keep him. Uh, I don't think they're really sold on a single prospect yet at this point. Otherwise, their direction would be really clear. Moving down, getting more assets, something the Jets badly need to fill out that roster, and bringing in perhaps the best wide receiver uh, prospect we've seen in quite some time in Jamar Chase. Obviously, Devontae Smith had a really great year this year as well. But Jamar Chase going fourth overall to the New York Jets gives Sam Darnold yet another weapon, something he badly needs there. They took Mekhi Becton last year. They're looking at a much improved offense moving forward. They have a, a good select, a good bounty of picks as, as well moving forward in the draft. That's somewhere they're going to have to take advantage of. Grabbing a wide receiver here makes a lot of sense. Absolutely. Now looking at pick five, uh, we do have the Miami Dolphins selecting in this spot. And I think it's pretty clear and obvious where they should go with this selection. It is on the defensive side of the ball, arguably the best player on the board still at this point, Micah Parsons out of Penn state, the opt out from this season. It's really unfortunate. He would have been, you know, one of the best players in college football had he played, but I think Miami is getting a really good player here at five. Yeah. Parsons going to Miami. That's something that we had been mocking at third overall, with them being able to move down with Cincinnati, pick up a, little, a few more assets makes all the sense. Parsons is going to be uh, probably the best defensive player from this class. He really jumps off the screen watching him from that linebacker position, can get after the QB, uh, can stop the run, go sideline to sideline. And him in Miami with Kyle Van Noy and Brian Flores' system is going to be scary for AFC East opponents. Absolutely. At pick six, we have the Philadelphia Eagles. Obviously, uh, they purposely lost their final game in order to ensure a uh, top six selection. So looking at what's on the board for them, we think it's pretty clear and obvious that they should look at the wide receiver position at pick six. For me personally, I, I don't know about you, but I, I think Devontae Smith is the best wide out on the board at this point. Yeah, he definitely is. He won offensive player of the year in college. He won the Heisman trophy, obviously uh, the first wide receiver to do that in quite some time. And now Philadelphia is grabbing a wide receiver is going to help out their quarterback situation long-term, obviously Jalen Hurts. Uh, is probably taking the reins from Carson Wentz. And I think Carson Wentz is going to move on from the Philadelphia Eagles this offseason or perhaps during the season next year. Uh, but it's going to be all about helping Hurts succeed. Uh, Devontae Smith is going to be the guy to come in and do that. Obviously, uh, the Alabama connection there as well uh, from when Hurts played in Alabama before transferring. Uh, and now Al uh, the Alabama receiver goes here to Philadelphia. Now looking at number seven, we have the Detroit Lions where there's a lot of rumors about Robert Sala potentially being the next head coach of the Lions and kind of looking at what that would speak to and what direction they might go with their selection if that hiring is made. I think Gregory Russo is a really good selection here. Another guy that had opted out, obviously a phenomenal physical specimen. At this point, I think Detroit's really going to be focused on fixing that front seven, which was actually you know really, really bad last year as a whole, as a whole uh, collective unit. But I, I think looking at what they have, it makes so much sense to go with the Gregory Rousseau pick. Obviously, they, they haven't had a physically imposing DN. Obviously, they have Trey Flowers, but, you know, he has not worked out necessarily for the contract that he had signed. Yeah, definitely. When you look at uh, coordinators that get brought into places, the first thing they try to do is emulate the success that they found from the place they got hired from. We saw that with Matt Patricia bringing in Trey Flowers here. Now, the Detroit Lions, if they bring in Robert Sala, are going to really want to improve that front four and that front seven that they have. Gregory Russo will be the pick. They're going to try and emulate what they had in Bosa, Armstead, Buckner, and so on on that defensive line when Sala had most of his success bringing them to the Super Bowl. Uh, and that's what they're going to try and emulate. Gregory Russo is going to come in and be the first selection under Robert Sala's regime there in Detroit, assuming he gets hired there. Absolutely. Now we're sitting here at picks at pick eight. I think that is pretty clear and obvious that they would go Zach Wilson in this situation, just considering their court, their current quarterback situation. It's very possible that we see Teddy Bridgewater play next year and Zach Wilson sits behind him. And I could see a very likely benching mid season, even at that point, but they are going to keep Bridgewater around for at least this next season, whether he's the starter or not, we don't know, but the, the next year in his deal is likely he, when he would get cut. Obviously there's not a ton of, dead money when he gets cut in that third year of his deal. Yeah, definitely. Zach Wilson comes in out of BYU. He's played his heart out this year. Uh, he's had a very phenomenal season for Brigham Young. And now you're seeing uh, that really pan out for him. I mean, top 10 pick in the NFL draft. Not many expected that coming into the season. Uh, and here he is going to Carolina at eight for Matt Rule. Hopefully Joe Brady will still be around. He's kind of a hot name on the 
coaching circuit right now. We'll see if he is back. Uh, that'll have a lot of importance on Zach Wilson's production early on in his career, I feel. Yep, absolutely. Now here at the Broncos selection, we think that it is going to be a corner off the board, just considering how their current roster construction is. Obviously, we don't think A.J. Boye is that long-term option. Very likely that he's out of the picture sooner rather than later. So looking at what is available, Patrick Sertan would be the selection for us at pick nine. Yeah, Denver goes out, gets a cornerback. You know, even before uh, A.J. Boye's suspension this year, the writing was kind of on the wall that they needed to add a cornerback into that cornerback room. With his suspension, obviously became even more clear. Sertan is going to be the selection here to the Denver Broncos as they address that cornerback position. And another team that is cornerback needy is right behind them in the Dallas Cowboys. For Dallas, it's all about improving that secondary. Obviously, Trayvon Diggs is a guy that you can build around in the secondary. But there's a lot of other you know needs in that secondary as well, safety and the other corner spot. I think, once again, we're going to see another corner off the board. And that is the cornerback out of Virginia Tech, Caleb Farley. Once again, another opt-out. Had a phenomenal season in 2019 with the Hokies. But at this point, it was very beneficial that he had opted out because he secures a top 10 pick. Yeah, you're looking at Dallas having to make a lot of tough decisions in the years past. Lost Byron Jones in free agency last year. Uh, they couldn't afford to pay him what he got on the market. Now they're coming back, getting a cheap option here in the first round. Caleb Farley is going to come in, fill that position, uh, really address a need for them. And hopefully with a healthy Dak Prescott, that team can be a lot better this next season. At pick 11 here, we have the New York Giants, and obviously they could use a little more dynamism in their offense. Obviously, Saquon Barkley will be back. But looking at the receiver position, you would like to see a dynamic weapon in that offense to help aid the development of Daniel Jones. Jalen Waddell really gives that an underneath presence and also a guy that could take the top off the defense. He's an absolute burner. Yeah, he really is. He comes in, gives you a little bit something different uh, next to Slayton and Shepard. Uh, you can put him in a variety of spots. And he's going to be a guy like what we saw with Henry Ruggs last year. If he runs well at the combine, does that kind of stuff, you could really see his draft stock even rise uh, above where he is at pick 11 here in a really strong receiver class. That's something to watch uh, going forward. At pick 12, we have the San Francisco 49ers. Obviously, they could be looking to move off of Jimmy Garoppolo's contract by cutting him. Obviously, they'd save him money, a, a lot of money in doing so. So then they'd have to ultimately replace him. Trey Lance out of North Dakota State, the guy that in 2019 who threw 28 touchdowns, zero picks in his, uh, in his season with the Bison, obviously had a showcase game this year. He did not play well at all in that, but obviously his stock is not hurt that much by that showcase game. Yeah, their general manager and Kyle Shanahan both see the writing on the wall here. The, most of their recent moves have been about salary cap management. They moved on from DeForest Buckner for a pick from the Indianapolis Colts. They moved on from Quan Alexander in a trade with the Saints. And now they're going to have to move on from Jimmy Garoppolo, probably releasing him, saves all the money uh, that they're going to need to keep most of their front seven intact there. That's going to be the main motivator for the San Francisco 49ers. They're going to have to address their cornerback room a little later in the draft. Trey Lance coming in, long-term cheap option, fifth-year option on him as well. Uh, and he's going to be a, a guy that could even elevate that offense a few years into his career. Uh, gives you a little bit of dynamism, like you had mentioned, at that QB position. At pick 13, we have the Chargers. And obviously, they can go one of two ways, I think, in this first round. They could look for an edge to replace Melvin Ingram because his contract is up at the end of the season. And they could also look at that tackle spot. But I think they, since it is a little bit of a deeper tackle class and it is edge class, I think it makes a ton of sense for them to go quitty pay from Michigan. You need to continue to keep that defense intact. And obviously doing quitty pay really goes a long way in doing so. Yeah, another salary cap motivated move, like you had mentioned there with Melvin Ingram. It just gets hard for some of these teams that are loaded with talent to really keep some of these higher end players around. They have to make moves to keep a lot of talent on their roster and grabbing quitty pay here in the first round does that you get a long-term cheap option again that's the most important thing to watch for some of these teams quitty pay comes in melvin ingram is out you get a long-term cheap option save money on the cap uh, and keep most of that roster around now here at pick 14 we have the minnesota vikings but we do have another trade on the way jacksonville is moving up to this selection so let's go ahead and take a look at what that could possibly look like for the Minnesota Vikings and Jacksonville Jaguars. And I will put them two in the machine. 14 for 21 ultimately is what it's going to come down to. One, let's see, let's take a look at what picks would be out. So pick 45 would be out from Jacksonville and then about 109 from Minnesota. That would be the move. Let's see 
if that one goes through. That one, once again, was declined by said you know, CPU, whatever you want to call this. So taking a look at it, now Jacksonville is on, on the clock here at 14. Main motivator was number 15, who they had to jump ahead of. Now Trevor Lawrence gets his number one target at tight end. Yeah, Kyle Pitts comes in out of Florida. That's something also important to watch here. Jacksonville has a long history of drafting players from the state of Florida. They did it with Tim Quarterman last year out of Miami. They did it with CJ Henderson out of Florida. That's where they really look a lot of the time. They look in-state uh, when they're coming to scouting. Kyle Pitts, an obvious in-state prospect out of Florida. And now they grab him right in front of the New England Patriots, a team that is really rumored to be looking at Kyle Pitts. He goes here to Jacksonville. You put an already good wide receiving group with Trevor Lawrence and added Kyle Pitts to it, maybe the most dynamic playmaker in the class at a position that it's hard to find those. That's something scary to watch in Jacksonville. I think that the future there could be extremely bright if they pull off a deal like this. Absolutely. At pick 15, now we look at the New England Patriots, and obviously they've had they've lost some guys at that linebacker spot. You had mentioned Landon Roberts. You had mentioned Cal Van Noy. So now looking at it, Jeremiah Usu-Karamoa would be the selection here at 15, a versatile linebacker for Bill Belichick. Yeah, they're probably a little disappointed that the Jaguars jumped them, were able to grab Kyle Pitts right in front of them, but coming back with the Wusu Koromoa uh, is a great add for them. You know, he was a really phenomenal player this year in the ACC for Notre Dame. Uh, he absolutely shined in that Clemson game. Uh, you throw the tape on of him, he's a little bit like Parsons, not quite as athletic, but he really jumps out as a good player. He's going to come out and do a lot of different things. You can definitely see Bill Belichick looking to add a player like him onto that defense. Now at 16, we have the Arizona Cardinals because I think that their their big concern right now is that corner room. There's a lot of uncertainty with Patrick Peterson, and they also have Byron Murphy in the mix, but they could use an outside corner, and J.C. Horn would give them that ability to do so. Yeah, Horn comes in for Arizona. They need to figure out that cornerback situation. Patrick Peterson is getting up there in age. Byron Murphy obviously is a building block there for them, probably moving forward. Grabbing J.C. Horn gives you the versatility at cornerback. Uh, and they badly need that. They need to improve uh, in that division. When you have to deal with teams like Seattle, uh, uh, the Los Angeles Rams, and so on, you have a lot of receiver threats on those teams in division. J.C. Horn's going to have to come in, ball out for them, and I think he's capable of doing so. Now here at 17, we have the Las Vegas Raiders, and looking at what they kind of need, interior defensive line really sticks out at this point. There's a couple of teams like Tampa that also could be looking in this direction, but we think for them personally that J2 Fele would be the best selection. Obviously, they need to generate more pressure up the middle. Obviously, they've been one of the worst sack teams in the NFL, statistically speaking. And I think J2 Fele really helps bring some bring some interior pressure for them. And also, he has the ability to stop the run. Yeah, definitely. You're looking at a, a long-time problem now for the Las Vegas Raiders uh, under John Gruden. They just need to improve defensively yet. Jay Tefele is going to come in, help them. They need help on all three levels of that defense. Tefele is going to come in, hopefully bolster that interior D line like you had mentioned. Uh, and they just need to start getting after the QB more. They need to start stopping the run a little bit more consistently. Tefele gives them both. Now here at pick 18, we have the Miami Dolphins. Obviously, earlier in the draft, they were able to nab Micah Parsons. Now we think they're going to come back and take an offensive player, guy that has you know, kind of fallen on some people's boards, but we still think he's worthy of the 18th overall selection. That's Rashad Bateman of Minnesota. Obviously, a lot of Miami fans want a speedster, but at the same time, Rashad Bateman <clears throat> can do a lot of different things for an offense. He can take the top off of defense. He has one of the highest yards per catch in the entire nation. A big time, big play receiver here at 18. Yeah, definitely. Bateman comes in, gives you a lot of different options, can uh, really route run. That's going to be his greatest strength for Miami. Uh, and that's something they badly need. They badly need to address that wide receiver room. Maybe later on in some of our mocks, maybe we could see them move up, be aggressive to go get Jalen Waddle. But at this point with how the boards fall and Rashad Bateman is the obvious receiver to go with. At pick 19, we think that Washington is definitely, definitely looking at that tackle spot. Christian Derrissaw makes a ton of sense here for Washington. Whoever the next quarterback is, whether they decide to trade for one, sign one, or potentially draft one, it really depends on what way they go that could affect this pick. But we think for the time being, it makes a ton of sense to go and get an offensive tackle for Washington. Yeah, that's going to be a long-term building block for them. That QB position is in question for sure. Alex Smith has played fairly well. He's going to be the comeback player of the year, no doubt. But I think Washington does need to improve that QB position. But Darisau is going to help protect whoever that next one is. I picked 20. We have the Chicago Bears. And obviously, they're kind of in that same situation as Washington. 
they're just too far away from, you know, the better tier of quarterbacks at their spot in the draft. So we could see them also addressing their offensive line, which they desperately need. Rashawn Slater would be the selection for them. Yep. Again, you're grabbing that tackle to protect the long-term QB option, whether that's Mitch Trubisky, whether that's a, a free agency option, who knows yet, but Chicago is going to have to improve that offense. Uh, offensive tackle is a building block for them moving forward with Slater. At 21, we have the Minnesota Vikings selecting here. Obviously they made that trade with Jacksonville kind of looking at what's on the board for them. We think Wyatt Davis is a phenomenal pick for the Vikings. You can kick Ezra Cleveland back out to that left tackle spot, or you can option him to keep him at a guard spot as well. It really depends on what they want to do at this point. Wyatt Davis, great move for the Vikings. Yeah, you have to just grab the best player you can at a position of need here if you're the Minnesota Vikings. Wyatt Davis is going to come in, help out Kirk Cousins a little bit, but most importantly, help Dalvin Cook. Had about 1,500 rush yards this year, didn't even play week 17. I expect for him to have another big season if Wyatt Davis is the selection. At pick 22, we have a lot of uncertainty at the tackle spot for the Indianapolis Colts, and historically speaking, they love to draft draft offensive tackles at this point. Liam Eichenberg would be the selection for Indianapolis. They're going to keep the continuity of their offensive line and keep it strong. Yeah, GM Chris Ballard there really prefers grabbing offensive linemen early on in the draft. It's really worked out well for him too. Indianapolis has continuously uh, been a competitive team. Eichenberg goes to Indianapolis at 22. Makes a lot of sense to me. At pick 23, we have the Cleveland Browns. Obviously, Olivier Vernon will not be returning back there next season. They need to have another edge opposite of Miles Garrett. They've, you know, failed to do that so far. Z, or excuse me, Jason Away could be a potential option here. Uh, also, Joseph Osai, Aziz uh, Ojalari. These are all guys that we could be looking at potentially at 23. But out of all these guys, personally for us, we do like Joseph Osai the most out of the University of Texas. He's a guy that's able to force fumbles, create turnovers, and he wrecks havoc in the backfield. Yeah, definitely. Osai comes in, fills a big need for them. Uh, obviously, Vernon with his injury. Also, the contract just didn't expect him to come back for the Cleveland Browns next season. Osai is the replacement for him long term. At pick 24, we have the Tennessee Titans selecting. Once again, they are also looking at the edge spot. Have, they've had a lot of issues trying to generate pressure this year. And Aziz Ojolari would be the selection out of Georgia. What do you think about this pick? Yeah, Ojolari is going to come in. They need to get after the quarterback. Uh, they obviously brought in Jadeveon Clowney, hoping to do so. His season ended prematurely, got put on IR. They just need to uh, get off the edge a little bit quicker. They also need to improve uh, their run defense a little bit. Ojolari gives you a little bit of both there. Uh, but specifically getting after the QB there in Tennessee is the biggest need for Mike Vrabel, Mike Vrabel and his defense. At pick 25, we have the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and looking at their selection, they do want to protect Tom Brady up front. There's also a couple of other things that they could do on the offensive line, but we do think that they would look more towards the guard spot. Elijah Vera Tucker would be the selection just considering they want to, you know, make sure there's not a lot of pressure up the middle for Tom Brady to have to ultimately deal with. Yeah, Tom Brady uh, in his age 42 season threw 40 touchdowns again. And I think that he's really, you know, showing them that he's worth what the contract he got. Uh, and the biggest thing for them is going to be protecting him, getting an insurance policy there uh, and protecting him up front. Also improving the run game for Ronald Jones uh, and Leonard Fournette. If he's back, Elijah Veritaker is going to help do both. At pick 26, we have the Baltimore Ravens, which has been a popular location for guards like Wyatt Davis at this point. But we do think that there's a possibility that they do look pos at, at the edge spot. Jason Away would be the selection. Baltimore needs to you know, stiffen up on the defensive line, and Away really helps them in this situation. Yeah, we've seen Harbaugh really value adding to that defensive front uh, quite a bit. Matthew Judon, a guy who's Going to be a name to watch this offseason if he gets franchise tagged. Really what the situation is with him in Baltimore. Jason Away gives him a long-term replacement for him to save money. Obviously, at some point, they're going to have to pay Lamar Jackson. At this point, they've been uh, playing with him on a rookie deal. We're going to see that roster kind of get thinned out a little bit once he gets paid. Jason Away is going to be a long-term replacement for Matthew Judon there in Baltimore. The New York Jets, once again here, are at 27. And ultimately, the Jets, it's going to be about defense with their second pick here in the first round. And you could see a guy like Eric Stokes being a good fit here. Why is that? Yeah, you, they just need to really improve in that secondary. Uh, I think cornerback is one of the most important positions uh, in football. And I think arguably the most important position on defense, that or edge. And looking at Stokes, he's going to come in. He's going to give you a guy who can match up maybe with Stephon Diggs. Uh, and there are two matchups here. He's going to 
uh, give you a little bit of versatility at that cornerback spot. They really badly need that. They brought in Pierre Desir this year, did not work out there. Uh, guys in the past like Daryl Roberts, they just have not had a lot of uh, cornerback stability or continuity. Eric Stokes is going to come in, give you that. Uh, and when the Jets were at their best, they had two really good corners in Antonio Cromartie, Darrell Rivas. Right now they have zero really good corners. Eric Stokes is the step in the right direction. Looking here at pick 28, we have the uh, Pittsburgh Steelers. We think that they will go at that running back spot, just considering that they haven't had a ton of success running the ball this year. James Conner hasn't been the, op the, the top tier option. Obviously, Benny Snell hasn't worked out great. So looking at Najee Harris, who was an absolute freak of nature at the University of Alabama, would be the pick here at 28. Right. I'm excited to watch him in the title game, too, uh, against Ohio State. He could come in even more solidify his uh, draft status. He's absolutely balled out this year for the Alabama Crimson Tide. We saw his insane hurdle in the Rose Bowl. Uh, and I just think Najee Harris is going to play himself into a first round pick more than likely. Yeah, absolutely. I think that title game is where a lot of eyes will be on. And I think it's very possible that he could dominate that game as a whole. Now looking at the uh, New Orleans Saints pick. Here, I, I think that they could look at the linebacker spot potentially. Zayvon Collins is just a really good player, and obviously the Saints know how to build their roster as a whole. And they're kind of looking almost at that best player available approach if you're the New Orleans Saints. Right, you bring in Zayvon Collins. He's a guy who's really helped turn Tulsa around. Tulsa was really competitive this year. Also, looking at Quan Alexander, who they brought in midseason, he did suffer a serious injury. He probably will not be back next season, is my assumption. Zayvon Collins comes in, fills a need right next to Demario Davis, and they're looking at a really good linebacker duo in that defense. Buffalo, once again, you talked about the AFC East and having to cover guys at that point. We could see them looking at the cornerback spot. There's a couple of guys that come to mind, but Darian Kendrick would be the selection for Buffalo. Right, that AFC East, you need to have some cornerbacks, but even more importantly for them, they're looking at a team that probably wants to rival Kansas City for the next few years. In order to do so, you have to have really top-end cornerback play coming and grabbing Darian Kendrick out of Clemson. He's going to help improve you in that area. Tredavious White, obviously already a great cornerback. They need to get another option uh, across from him on the outside. Darian Kendrick is that guy. At pick 31, we have Green Bay, which we think could go a multitude of ways, cornerback, wide receiver, or tackle obviously with the Bakhtiari injury and just some other inconsistent play. We think uh, Samuel Cosme is a great selection here. Obviously the, the Packers lost Bulaga at, you know, last off season to the chargers and, you know, with not a healthy Bakhtiari, it kind of puts them in a weird selection here. Yeah. The interior of that offensive line has performed very well this year. That tackle spot, you know, had been pretty stable with David Bakhtiari with him tearing his ACL you're looking at a, a pretty big question mark there for Green Bay, not only this playoffs, but the start of next season. They won't have him back more than likely until about the midpoint of the season. Grabbing Cosme gives you a little bit of insurance there uh, long term uh, in case Bakhtiari's recovery goes a little slower. And then you can always kick him back over to right tackle to fill out that offensive line. I think Cosme is a no brainer here with how the board's fallen. At pick 32, we have the Kansas City Chiefs, and we've been a little consistent with this selection over the last couple of weeks. We see Terrace Marshall Jr would be a really good pick here for the Kansas City Chiefs, just considering that they only have two guys under contract. And Terrace Marshall's a great red zone threat. Obviously, him and Travis Kelsey would be absolutely lethal in the red zone as a, a great duo for Patrick Mahomes. Right. You're looking at a long-term replacement for Sammy Watkins, a guy with a lot of talents, really shined uh, at LSU, and now you're getting a really good player into that Chiefs offense, something that the rest of the league probably doesn't want to see. Last year, they grabbed Clyde edwards elaire 32nd overall, and in this mock draft here, they grab Terrace Marshall Jr., another LSU product. Really love that for the Kansas City Chiefs. They're going to be scary for a long, long time. Yeah, thanks everybody for tuning in. Subscribe if you do enjoy our content. Also, leave a like if you like this video. Uh, we, we're so excited to continue to push out mock draft content to you, and we're excited to see you in the next video.